In February of 2021, she launched the Center for Energy Ethics, creating a dynamic research environment to explore ways to create a better energy future. More recently, she's been appointed as the director of the Scottish Research Alliance for Energy, Homes, and Livelihood. The Research Alliance will bring together all the universities in Scotland, along with business, industry, government, and community organizations to accelerate Scotland's interdisciplinary research capacity. In this context, she stresses the importance of research funding for the implementation of energy transitions. Meta High is also winding up her European Research Council funded project on the ethics of oil, finance, moralities, and environmental politics in the global oil economy. Based on multiple ethnographic studies, this six-year project involved a 10-person research team to examine how people in the oil economy make financial and ethical evaluations, valuations of oil. The project brings an anthropological sensitivity to issues of money, energy, and climate change, and provides a framework for the investigation of how oil valuations relate to political reforms and new climate initiatives. As an anthropologist, Mehdi High's field research has been in Mongolia and Colorado, my home state. It actually turns out that uh, uh, Mehdi and I had met back in uh, 2016 or 2017. Um, I didn't quite remember. I thought we had met, but uh, when we saw each other, she reminded me where we had had drinks somewhere. Uh, she focuses on questions of ethics and economic life. In 2008, she received her PhD in social anthropology from Cambridge for her research in Mongolia. There, she studied the involvement of Buddhist monks in a countrywide gold rush. In this project, she examined the institutionalization of religious practice and self-transformational ethics in the context of a booming gold mining industry and dramatic political reform. Then she was funded by the Leverhulme Trust to carry out a three-year research project in Colorado, focusing on the technology of hydraulic fracting. Her field work on, with on-site crew and executives in company headquarters informed her interest in topics such as energy industries, commodity markets, and global finance calculation and risk. Underwriting all her research projects, where money, metals, and energy travel far beyond national borders, is a desire to understand how global economic processes intersect with intimate moral views. In addition to her academic publications, such as two different special issues, she's also published two different special issues on the topic of energy ethics, edited together with another one of my colleagues, uh, Jessica Smith at the Colorado School of Mines. She's been cultivating interdisciplinary engagements uh, uh, with artists and filmmakers, as well as by serving as a co-chair for Research and Environmental Sustainability Board and screening committee members for the St. Andrews Prize for the Environment. Meta High is currently writing a new book with the working title, Relentless Optimism, Oil, Money, and Entrepreneurial Capitalism. On this note, she's with us today to share some insights about her longstanding research in Colorado. Her lecture is entitled, Do You Really Not Want to, uh, Do You Really Not Know That? Energy Ethics and the Matter of Facts in the U.S. Oil and Gas Industry. Mete, I give it to you. Thank you so much, Carl. For that, uh, we have an echo here. I turned mine off. I'm off. Okay, Giovanni, I don't know how you want us to do this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it seems like Giovanni, he, he got the echo fixed here. So uh, thank you so much, Cal, for your, your very warm and much too long introduction. Um, it is a real pleasure uh, to be here today and, and share with you some of the work that I've been doing. 
Um, Giovanni, he suggested that I might open today's talk with um, first an introduction to the Center for Energy Ethics. So I'm going to talk about that just like for the first five minutes, and then I will launch into a kind of more regular presentation. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Coming up. Now we can see it. Okay. Uh, we 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 see the. Um... Uh, Giovanni, can you let me know if my slideshow shows up all right? Yes, it shows, but it is still in the in the. Mm, Presenter mode, you need to go to the top uh, left, in the display setting. Giovanni? Yes. Could you let me know if the slides are showing all right? Or is it not in presenter view? You are in presenter view. Or maybe if Giovanni isn't yet by his desk, if someone else could let me know, that would be really great. We see these. We don't see that. We have to change it. Down. There we go. Okay. Right. So, uh, the Center for Energy Ethics. Um, as Cal, he mentioned, um, we launched it. It's okay. <laughs> Good. Back in February 2021. And I work as an anthropologist at University of St. Andrews. So just kind of setting the scene um, University of St. Andrews is um, one of the UK's oldest universities. And for us, it's a relatively small university when it comes to how many students we have. Uh, we are about 10,000 students. So for the UK, we are actually on the smaller side. Um, and one of the great things about being at a university of our size is that you can relatively easily meet with the very top of senior management at the university and pitch ideas. And so I pitched the idea of launching the Center for Energy Ethics. I was very keen for us at St. Andrews to have a really exciting and dynamic research environment where we could work across disciplines because so much of the work we do at St. Andrews is anchored in our distinct disciplinary fields. And the university was very supportive right from the beginning. Um, it took two meetings. Um, then they had found a private donor who was very passionate about the kind of research um, that I was doing with my research team. And the uh, private donor kind of got the idea of, um, of, of launching a new research center that is uh, the first focus for us is on excellent research, really just creating a good, supportive, nurturing, exciting environment where we can work um, and work together um, and really build these collaborative teams. Uh, our second objective is on policy engagement. So as a research center, we are very keen to contribute to policy making that is happening in Scotland and the UK, and right now we are also forging links with EU level policy making in energy and climate. Um, and the third objective is on, is on public engagement. So um, I felt that it was very important with the research center that we don't have conversations only among ourselves as academics or even ourselves with policymakers 
but really engaging local communities and engaging kind of far and wide and have conversations, have dialogues, have debates, have tough questions where we might not have the answers, but at least the questions get raised from all kinds of stakeholders. Um, and so um, we were able to, to launch the center. It's primarily private donor funded. So we have several donors um, that, are, that are contributing money. When it comes to our private donors, St. Andrews has very strict due diligence as to where, where the money can come from. And I have additional restrictions. Um, so I don't want the center, for example, to take money from energy industries. Um, as I feel it really, um, there's a risk that it could affect how people perceive the research we're doing. Um, and might question what kind of interests are really at play. So I don't want that. So I have made, um, yeah, introduced extra restrictions on who could donate to the center and how they donate and all of that. Um, uh, if anyone is interested in this aspect of, of research, you know, do reach out. I'm always up for chat. Yeah. Um, the Center for Energy Ethics very quickly grew. Uh, I had an ambition for the center to reach right across the entire university uh, and not be anchored only in, say, social science. Um, so we work across all disciplines, arts, humanities, social and natural sciences. At St. Andrews, um, the center involves 58 researchers. And then we have also opened up the center worldwide to affiliated uh, researchers and practitioners. We have a lot of artists also involved in the center. So at the very core, we have interdisciplinarity. Um, and I, for me, and I'm, I think like here, I'm probably um, you know, preaching to the converted, but um, at a place like St. Andrews, uh, where things are quite traditional and very anchored in distinct disciplines, uh, for me, as a researcher, I feel that interdisciplinarity is so important um, as a complement to my disciplinary engagements, because I often then will get challenged. I'll get these questions that will come from unexpected sides and, you know, new questions get asked, new literatures um, get introduced, and they can really encourage this broader reflection on, uh, on the topic of my research. Um, and then I have here on this slide, the second point for me about interdisciplinarity is it also just opens us up um, at the very core to a broader engagement where we might think about not just engaging with other academics, but really truly engaging across, um, across societies, uh, involving multiple stakeholders and have that crucial global perspective. If you're working on topics of energy, climate change, and like in my case, where I'm becoming increasingly involved in like net zero policy work, having an, a global perspective, I think is more important than ever. To give you a flavor of what, what goes on at the center, we have a lot of events. Sorry, we are um, at the moment uh, organizing and hosting about 35 events a year. Inclusivity, accessibility, is very important at the center. That means that almost all our events are available as hybrid events so that we can open our doors to the world and not only be accessible to those who happen to be in our corner of Scotland. As a result, the Center for Energy Ethics is a truly global research center and we have a very strong following in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, um, places where we know in the UK, it would be very difficult for people to afford to travel, never mind if they want to travel. And thirdly, visa restrictions um, means that now that we can, we can have conversations virtually, we can engage with, um, with our collaborators worldwide, independently of practical issues such as visas that are a true hindrance for many researchers. Our program is very broad. Um, so this just gives you a, a little sense. This is not even all our events for November. Um, I had to cut it down so I could fit it to the slide. Um, and you will see here like some of the many things and I'm really inviting all of you to get involved in the center and make it your space too. We have a weekly newsletter that goes out. So please do sign up. Um, we have things like a blog where you can contribute. Um, 
They, these are relatively short pieces, and this is a great way of um, sharing your research in a more informal way. We have visiting fellowships, so you can come and join us physically at St. Andrews, both as a student or as a member of staff. We host a range of grants. Um, at St. Andrews, uh, we're able to host a lot of different postdocs. I've just put here some of them, um, but yeah, there's a lot more. So please just follow up, send me an email if interested. Here you have our website. <laughs> so as I said, please come join us. So a question that I do get asked quite often is, now two and a half years later, what do I see as kind of like the biggest surprise in setting up the Center for Energy Ethics? And that surprise for me has a lot to do with the environment that St. Andrews is and probably the broader research environment of the UK. So as I mentioned, at St. Andrews, um, we, are, we are very much kind of uh, organized according to our disciplines. And that means that a lot of our research activity is anchored in our disciplinary ways of knowing. When we think about, you know, what is knowledge um, for, for us at St. Andrews, it is so anchored in our particular methodologies um, our particular literatures, our particular ways of um, even like gathering data, evaluating data, presenting data. Um, and one of the advantages, I guess, of that really deep anchoring in your discipline is that after after years of training, you know, you truly become an expert, right? Like you sit and you have this, very strong foundation in your discipline. And that happens if you're an anthropologist, it happens if you're in the, in the School of Engineering. Um, and as these kind of discipline experts, we know what we know. And we might also have a sense of what we don't know. What are the limits to our knowledge? When is it that we feel that these conversations are brought to the very edge of our knowledge and we might get into conversations where we don't know and we have to admit that we don't know. And when we have to admit that we don't know, it might feel like I've been caught, I should know this, I should know this article, I should know this publication, I should know this author. Or it might feel like um, almost like evidence of ignorance, a superficial level of knowledge. Um, and these are not comfortable spaces, right? If, if you are being kind of habituated into an expert position of knowledge production. And what has been interesting with the Center of Energy Ethics is the biggest challenge has not been fundraising. Um, which is like a key job for me as director of the center, is also not developing um, a great pipeline of events or new initiatives. Like we have that in spades. We have an abundance of great ideas and we are able to translate a lot of ideas into practice. The biggest challenge has been to make our researchers comfortable with not knowing. Like that is for me, uh, the biggest challenge that, that we have at the Center for Energy Ethics. And that's, that's part of my, my the title for today's talk, right? Like, that question of, like, do you really not know that, right? Like that, that kind of question will come up and I see my job and, and everyone else in the center a part of our job is to make people feel comfortable when they get that kind of reaction, um, feel comfortable not knowing, feel comfortable when they say, actually, I don't know that, but that's a really great idea. Or I want to, you know, I want to really get my head around that debate or thank you so much for bringing this up. That's very helpful. Um, but developing that kind of um, 
uh, comfort and mm, ease with not knowing that that has been the biggest challenge and so <laughs> i would just like now that i'm i'm going to go into my paper i would just like you all to reflect on this aspect of scholarly knowledge um what is it that's really at play in those moments um how do we as academics maybe mobilize knowledge and maybe produce boundaries where we define people as experts and not experts um to what extent are we boundary makers as we go about this kind of disciplinary knowledge anchoring um so i'm now going to turn to colorado and my interlocutors um who are definitely boundary builders um and I'd just like you to just keep in the back of your mind the possibility that um, perhaps we as academics have something in common here with my interlocutors in Colorado in how, how we mobilize knowledge um, in creating boundaries. So it's just a little dot, dot, dot for you to keep in mind as I will now share my paper with you. So the paper is called The Matter of Facts in the US Oil and Gas Industry. And I, I'd, I'd like to just put a disclaimer. This is very much work in progress. Um, and it's a very particular perspective that you are now going to get on the oil and gas industry. Um, I am not trying to share here with you super polished work. So please bear with me. And I very much look forward to any comments or suggestions you might have. So, it was a cold autumn day and the wind blew in heavy gusts through the wind tunnels created by the tall office buildings in downtown Denver. I was in the corporate heart of the city, searching for the headquarters of a leading provider of specialty equipment and services to those exploring for and producing oil and gas in the United States. Minutes later, I found myself in the warm lobby, sitting across from large TV screens, providing the latest news and with neat stacks of industry magazines and collections of financial newspapers on the table in front of me. Bill Gates appeared on the screen, sharing his optimism for our energy future. While recognizing the challenges ahead for fossil fuel free heating, lighting, and transport, asking, how exactly we would achieve this, his answer was in his own words, simple. As he has later elaborated in a blog post addressing transport specifically, we will, and I quote, use clean electricity to run all the vehicles we can and get cheap alternative fuels for everything else, end quote. In this envisioned zero carbon world, Thanks to EVs powered by renewables, it would be possible to continue our reliance on cars. Solar, wind, and hydropower would be optimized, while better, cheaper, and lighter batteries would be developed. For heavy, long-haul transportation, Bill Gates suggested switching trucks, cargo ships, and passenger jets from today's crude oil products to advanced biofuels and electrofuels. This vision of mobility was predicated on what he saw as, and I quote, lots and lots of innovation, end quote, offering a portrait of a future that we can imagine as not here just yet, but also as not far beyond our reach. A future where the energy mix does not involve hydrocarbons, but instead various sources of renewable energy. A future to be created, a future to be brought into being through innovation. The receptionist got my attention to let me know that the company CEO was now ready for our meeting. This was our first meeting, and after a firm but friendly handshake, he started telling me about his personal journey, the company, and the future. His words soon echoed those of Bill Gates. It wasn't because he was talking about renewables. Instead, he shared with Bill Gates 
an emphatic, almost triumphant belief in the potential and promise of innovation. He described his journey from grad student to CEO as, and I quote, very much a blind squirrel finds a nut story where we came up with a couple of ideas that helped launch the Shell Revolution, end quote. The Shell Revolution here refers to a transformation in the US oil and gas industry in the mid 2000s that arose from the combination of horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, and other technologies. This brought new reservoirs into production and turned legacy oil and gas fields depleted from years of conventional production into hives of activity. Here on this chart, you can see that moment that I'm talking about, like in the mid 2000s, um, where if you look at the horizontal well production, um, you can see this spike um, in both oil and gas. Now, uh, for this CEO, the Shell Revolution happened in the US, not just because of the country's particular geology, its vast economy of scale, its particular property rights regime, where the subsurface can be privately owned and rights holders receive royalty payments for the oil and gas produced. With a knowing smile, he said that it also happened in the US because, and I quote, Americans are innovators very open-minded about trying ideas and committed to making it work, end quote. Having been nominated for, and a few months later celebrated as the winner of the inaugural Denver Business Journal's Trailblazer Award, he proudly concluded that, and I quote, one of my big roles has been as an innovator, end quote. In contemporary capitalism, innovation, is often presented as a silver bullet to any and all problems. As the historians of science, Lee Vinsel and Andrew Russell have noted, innovation is like, and I quote, a sales pitch about the future that doesn't yet exist, end quote. It offers a promise that with just the right amount of know-how, resourcefulness and entrepreneurial attitude, challenges can become opportunities. It is a trope that turns the political into the entrepreneurial by rearticulating deep inequalities into experiments that promise worth and value. Solutions can be developed, new wealth can be generated, and communities from small to large can be transformed. Innovation speak, as Vincent and Russell refer to it, presents futures charged with optimism and potentiality as long as the public sector, private companies, NGOs, and individuals collectively and actively cultivate what Arjuna Padurai has called, and I quote, the capacity to aspire, end quote. An aspiration that isn't grounded in and limited to individual motivation, but shaped as a cultural capacity. In the United States, as Eisen Wilf has shown in his work, Business consultants nurture and capitalize on this bridging between creative imagination as on the one hand, a radical individual property that is fleeting and unpredictable, and on the other, a highly routinized, systematic and fundamental business strategy for creating new materials, new technologies and new processes within the context of shortening business cycles. As he has noted, and I quote, it would be difficult to find a more ubiquitous trope than innovation in today's business world, end quote. Indeed, innovation has become an aspiration in itself, hailing people's diverse visions and directing them towards the production of enterprise. And this is where I have to, like, I, I just don't know in Germany if it is similar, but I can tell you in the UK, it very much is. And the universities, that world is no exception to really embracing this innovation trope. Um, uh, Lili Irani has observed in her work on what she calls entrepreneurial citizenship, that an important part of the discursive promise of innovation is, and I quote, not only that one makes one's own future, 
but that one can generate progressive futures for others, end quote. As such, it casts entrepreneurs as agents who create dreams and craft worlds. And supposedly, any of us could do this. By tapping into our so-called creative persona, we are presented with a promise that we can all become entrepreneurs, from the least to the most privileged. It is a trope that has become part of the so-called philanthropic capitalism, with Bill Gates at the helm, where strategies for market stimulation and demand creation are integrated into charitable giving. It also sits comfortably within the oil and gas industry, harking back to the early pioneering days of the industry, while simultaneously offering industry participants a way to demonstrate their continuing agility and expertise in entrepreneurial capitalism. It is a trope that has captured the imagination of not only business, business executives, but also the wider public. To see energy futures as emerging from and requiring innovation is thus hardly surprising. New materials, technologies, and processes will be required to bring about the change that is envisioned. Additionally, it is also a moment in time when this so-called innovation speak is ubiquitous. Interestingly, according to a recent article in The Atlantic, and I quote, Although actual innovation might be in decline, mentions of innovation are resurgent. We just can't stop talking about it, end quote. And the Harvard Business Review has made a plea that we simply, quote, stop calling it innovation, end quote. While innovation speak flourishes among my interlocutors in the oil and gas industry, it is precisely renewables potential for innovation that many not only bring into question, but outright reject. So this is a crux of my paper <laughs> that I will now um, elaborate on. In this paper, I will examine how oil and gas industry participants in Colorado reflect on the potential energy mix of the future. As producers of oil and gas, which they describe as cheap, dense, and reliable, they position themselves as responsible for what can be achieved through decades of concerted scientific experimentation and innovation. For them, the energy mix on which we have come to rely crystallizes the successful conjoining of the early day oil prospectors risk-taking and decades of geoscientific and engineering knowledge. This entrepreneurial ethos is promulgated through its close association with and connection to what I'm calling the field, the very sites of oil production, sites where oil is a visible and material, tangible and observable presence. In Colorado, most of my interlocutors work for small to medium-sized oil and gas companies. So these are not the Chevrons, the Exxon Mobiles, the BPs or the Equinors, but rather the prospector spirited smaller endeavors where the field is not far from you. As I will show, many of my interlocutors dismiss and reject renewable energy imaginaries, like the one presented by Bill Gates. They mock and ridicule these energy scenarios, scorning them for being, in their words, and I quote, factually impossible, end quote, and therefore ultimately irresponsible. While oil and gas industry participants see their own industry as a responsible and proven agent of innovation with more than a century of history behind them, they deem renewable energy industries devoid of such potential for innovation. Exploring these mocking dismissals, I will show how the trope of innovation is mobilized to make moral claims about energy futures. At a time when companies must orchestrate and anticipate market changes by generating a constant stream of new products, new technologies, and new services, business innovation is not only a key component in contemporary capitalism. I suggest it is also a powerful moral commentary on who is seen to deserve 
to play a key role in future configurations of life. I will here draw on ongoing ethnographic research that I have carried out in Colorado between 2013 and 2020 for the purposes of this, this, this book um, in the oil fields and beyond. In Well County, home to more than 22,000 active oil and gas wells, fieldwork has taken me into the offices of landmen who negotiate and acquire mineral rights leases to the land where operations are planned and carried out. It has taken me out on the drilling rigs and the smaller workover rigs, where operations often involve a huge number of trucks, equipment, and people. It has taken me into the cruise shops, where trucks and equipment are based, and health and safety training is carried out, as well as to the producing operators' field offices in the county seat of Greeley, where wells are monitored digitally and engineers are on constant standby. It has taken me to the offices of environmental subcontractors, surveying well pads and reporting spills and leaks, and into the homes of former workers who have reached retirement, experienced layoffs, or been involved in terrible accidents. It has taken me into the executive headquarters in Denver and up to the top floors of corporate governance with its presidents, CEOs, and boards of directors, as well as into the private equity firms and private investor firms located nearby. My hosts have led me into the workspaces and to the events that take place there. Sometimes they have given me an office. Other times they have let me shadow them as they go about their work day. I have been on site when starting drilling and we've gone together to the local hole in the wall eateries for cheap tacos and iced tea. At other times, I have found myself at corporate events, such as intense investor calls, in-house client presentations, and disaster management when things go wrong. Beyond these workspaces, fieldwork has also taken me to family barbecues, dinners, dog walks in the evening, church services on Sundays, and whatever else forms part of my interlocutors' everyday lives. This participant observation, along with interviews, form the basis for this chapter. So the next section is entitled Towards a Green Colorado. My fieldwork has coincided with much political upheaval, both across the state and at a federal level. In January 2019, Governor Jared Polis took office and many in the oil and gas industry joked that Colorado was now going to be run by Boulder, a nearby town that one of my interlocutors described as, and I quote, pretentiously liberal, end quote. Another saw Boulder as a local version of what he called, and I quote, hippie, free thinking and anti-oil California, end quote. Political reforms have introduced greater regulation of oil and gas exploration and production, as well as increased non-industry representation in state-level oil and gas monitoring bodies. Local public hearings on the implementation of new Senate bills have brought those for and those against hydrocarbons into shared politicized spaces, making one of my interlocutors comment how, and I quote, under polis, oil and gas have become extremely politicized, much more than before. He developed this Senate bill, 181 for the Boulder counties of the world. It was not developed for Well County, end quote. With a mission to make Colorado use 100% renewable energy for its electricity supply, by 2040, Governor Polis announced in 2019 that 19 new solar projects were set to begin in Colorado. While this formed part of a larger plan towards an energy transition away from hydrocarbons, my interlocutors responded dismissively. As one of them said, I quote, I am puzzled that the governor would be taking victory laps on this announcement. The projects will supply just 0.2% of annual power demand in Boulder County. In total, the 19 projects will, just, will supply just 0.04% of state power demand. I'm proud of what I do and the energy oil and gas supply. For scale, the total energy production projected 
for these 19 solar projects over 20 years is equivalent to the energy produced by one horizontal well drilled by our company in rural Well County in just three years, end quote. One of the other guys replied, and I quote, holy smokes, that's a bubble buster. I wonder how much land is wasted by these so-called projects. Plus the life of these things is only about 20 to 25 years, assuming no hail damage, and then it's off to the dump as toxic waste, not very green, end quote. A third guy joined the banter and commented, quote, if you just want to employ people, the solar industry is great because it is the least efficient and least productive way to make power. It wouldn't exist without subsidies. Lower productivity equates to lower, not higher, standards of living. He's just selling BS and rhetoric because this will make the left feel good. Obviously, it's about politics and not real business like ours. Like we actually have to make the numbers work for us, end quote. A few days later, I was catching up with one of the guys again, just one on one. He brought up the solar projects and said, and I quote, you know, Paul is put on his social media that he was really proud, having just green lighted 19 solar projects. That was apparently his so-called green Colorado economy. He has this big, long soapbox message about how solar panels, these 19 projects, are a wave of the future. Then, when you look at the amount of energy that they would produce, it's nothing. One well here in Colorado, online for three years, produces more energy. Just one well produces more energy in three years than all those 19 projects over a 20-year span. That's real. There's a huge delta in the energy density that comes out of solar. It has no future, end quote. The sentiment that renewables, not just solar, has no future was commonly voiced across the echelons of the industry. Renewables lower energy densities were presented as a fact that spoke for itself. As one said, and I quote, facts don't discriminate. They don't cater to opinion or projections, end quote. Drawing on epistemological registers that position empirical observations as unnegotiable truth claims, this fact of energy density was taken to inform and delimit all aspects of renewable energy. Materials, technologies, and processes were presented as all irrelevant due to the fundamental limit in renewable energy's density. As a result, this made renewables seem devoid of potential for innovation and change. It was as if renewables lacked the potential for optimization, as something that couldn't be improved, couldn't be better harnessed, something that lacked a credible sales pitch for a future that doesn't yet exist. By turning big and broad questions about the future energy mix into specific questions about energy density, my interlocutors were engaged in affirmative acts of boundary making. As in scholarship um, on the mobilization of facts in US environmental politics, my interlocutors black boxed issues to try to make them less political. Through their banter, they collectively asserted, affirmed and reaffirmed facts, claiming the scientific high ground in efforts to deal with divisive political realities changing investor interests and energy futures that would put their own jobs at risk. Similar to Latour's, quote, fact builders, end quote, they strove to position facts as, and I'm again quoting Latour, an obligatory passage point, end quote, for everyone else who wished to pursue the same interests. In claiming this authority, they positioned themselves as gatekeepers of innovation, gatekeepers of the potential energy futures that could be built. As long as the energy density of oil and gas was superior to renewables, renewables could not challenge an energy future centered on hydrocarbons. As noted by Jasanov, such gatekeeping where certain facts are positioned as more important than others, where the individual observer is placed in the background and where the facts are made to speak for themselves, this pivots delicately on the extent to which people can make credible claims to knowledge and expertise. 
It involves a temporal orientation that embraces the past in its claims on the future. As such, it is not just what futures might potentially be built, but it also mobilizes established expertise to authoritatively claim what futures can indeed be built. For participants in the oil and gas industry, their expertise builds on and reaches back to the early pioneering days of the wildcatters. Wildcatters refer to oil prospectors, especially the 19th century prospectors in the US who drilled remote exploratory wells and as they found oil, eventually founded the industry. While giant multinational corporations dominate the public image of the industry today, the independent wildcatters are recognized for bringing it into existence. Celebrated by the industry for their courage and bravery, persistence and hard work, wildcatters continue to be significant for many industry actors today as the moral exemplars. As noted in history books, and I quote, these men could keep on going, not only when the current was with them, but when it was most decidedly running the other way, end quote. Drilling dry holes, taking on escalating debt, and confronting the disbelief of others, these wildcatters are admired for continuing to pursue their dreams against all odds. For my interlocutors, Captain Lucas, for example, who drilled the spindle top gusher in 1901, exemplifies how wildcatters dared to invent new means to find oil, demonstrating not only their technical abilities, but also the fast pace with which they innovated the industry. At an industry event held every year in Denver, the so-called Wildcatter of the Year Award is presented to a prominent leader in the industry, applauded for having a so-called, and I quote, entrepreneurial spirit, end quote, in undertaking innovative exploratory work in the American West today. While conflicts and disputes over natural resource exploration have been central to this history, and continue to form part of its evolution today. This contestation is not detectable at this industry event, nor do attendees generally reference the highly gendered and strikingly white history of the wildcatters. Instead, the legacies of the wildcatters are emphatically commemorated and celebrated with award winners being asked to continue the moral example of the innovative industry forefathers. So here on this slide, this is a photo that I've taken from one of these uh, Wildcatter of the Year award ceremonies. Approaching the oil field with an entrepreneurial spirit is thus anchored in the past, providing the proven expertise and insight to be able to today assert authoritatively what is possible and what isn't. For my interlocutors who are strikingly proud of the industry and its ability to continue to innovate, renewable energy scenarios are deemed factually impossible. For them, it simply would not be possible. Contemplating a renewables only energy imaginary is for them naive and evidence of ignorance. They feel that there's no real question about the possibility of a decarbonized energy future. And as such, any advocacy for renewables can only be based on what they call emotion. And with renewables lacking the potential for innovation, renewable energy futures are not about economics, not about powering the electric vehicles that Bill Gates envisioned but rather about making us, quote, feel good, end quote. And as such, many of my interlocutors see it as an effective way to win over voters. Frustrated with the governor's and his supporters' short-sightedness, my interlocutors thus deem the green Colorado economy not just an unrealistic plan, but also an irresponsible plan. The next section is entitled, No Energy Transition. 
While my interlocutors in the rejection of renewables drew on and mobilized facts as authoritative truth claims, they were presented as if they spoke for themselves. They relied on the same vernacular in the advocacy for oil and gas in our future energy mix. By vernacular, I'm referring to Candice Callison's approach to the so-called communal life of facts, end quote, and how charts, graphs, and quantification more generally are produced and assembled to form a contradistinction seemingly detached from the sticky, messy issues of politics and ethics, operating as a kind of, quote, anti-politics machine, end quote. And this is good old James Ferguson, 1994. Facts were the substance that whisked political realities out of sight and all the while performed its own politics by persuading oil and gas industry participants of innovation's future path. Their vernacular enabled them to collectively produce not only certainty and optimism in oil and gas's inevitability, but also helped them assert their own distance from feel-good politics. When advocating for oil and gas's longevity, my interlocutors thus listed various statistics, such as the continuing sharp increase in global coal production, a global electricity system that is not decarbonizing, not even in the US, and many other figures that evidenced the persistent dominance of fossil fuels in the local, state, federal, and international energy mix. Interlocutors adopted with glee the language of energy transitions, even net zero, to convey hydrocarbons as key to our energy future. An executive who was in a who was in sales mode and pitching his vision of our energy future to his team said, and I quote, the biggest driver of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the US and globally by far has been natural gas, taking market share away from coal. 60% of US reductions come from that. So natural gas displacing coal, that's a decarbonization step that's meaningful, end quote. An employee laughed and responded, quote, what about wind turbines? Won't they get us to net zero? End quote. Around this time, the industry interest group called Energy Strong had shared mocking scenarios on social media that portrayed the state covered in wind turbines, especially Boulder County. The images were accompanied by text saying, quote, Boulder County, you have 46,000 acres of open space. Why is your county not building the wind turbines you're advocating for? Practice what you preach, end quote. In the meeting, the guy next to me shook his head and just said, quote, Boulder, NIMBY capital of Colorado, end quote. And others shrugged and remarked, quote, economics don't lie. Let's see what happens with no subsidies, end quote. The speaker joined in, quote, oh man, this naive and misdirected government belief that somehow a few more solar panels and wind turbines will reduce the demand for oil? They're not, they're simply not. But is this sort of opposition to oil and gas development that just drives production elsewhere to other countries? And that doesn't reduce greenhouse gas emissions. People don't understand energy, end quote. The frustration that people don't understand energy forms part of the boundary making, demarcating who's in and who's out of the group. It cements the vernacular as their interpretive framework, defining what evidence matters and why, what does and what should drive action. What gets categorized as knowledge and what doesn't? It highlights a particular kind of energy literacy as their shared mode of apprehending the industry and its critics, the world and its potential futures. Returning to the CEO with which I opened this paper, he recently commented that, and I quote, Hydrocarbons have gone from 87% of global energy 30 years ago to 84% today. We are not in the middle of an energy transition. We are investing a lot of money in some new energy technologies. Some of this is great, but it's not an energy transition. Three decades from now, 
the vast majority of global energy will come from hydrocarbons. That's just math and physics. So pretending that we are going to quickly transition in a decade or two or three decades has led to this sort of mainstream belief that we should oppose pipelines. We should spend a third of a trillion dollars to make our electricity grid less stable and more expensive. I just want some honesty and some people looking at the actual numbers of what's really happening. The world runs on oil and gas. Nothing is going to change that. We are the industry that enables every other industry, end quote. As fact builders who positioned energy densities as obligatory passage points for anyone else who wished to pursue the same interests, my interlocutors were ready to deploy their facts in their conversations, in their banter, in their meetings. They were ready to turn to numbers, charts, and percentages to build broad narratives to persuade at any point. While presenting facts as if they spoke for themselves and using these to declare limits on what challenges could become opportunities, what potentialities could become realities, they partook in the politics of energy under the guise of distanced, fact-based entrepreneurial expertise proven ever since the wildcatters successfully drilled the first well and brought cheap, dense, and reliable energy to market. So to conclude, one day I sat with a close interlocutor over a cup of coffee and chatted. I remarked that that seemed to me a rather conservative view of energy possibilities. I asked, quote, is all we can hope for that gas comes to be replaced by coal? End quote. To which he replied, I quote, I'm so proud of this industry. Ever since they first struck oil, we've been able to innovate. We have gone against the grain and tried new things. We have failed most definitely, but we have also learned from our mistakes. We have developed new technologies. I mean, who would have thought that we can now drill down two miles and then make laterals that extend for miles? Who would have thought that? We are and have always been an industry that innovates, end quote. Anchored in the early years of wildcat risk-taking, bolstered by decades of geoscientific knowledge and engineering endeavors, the oil and gas industry is presented by its own participants as a quintessential and superior innovator. An innovator that continues to find new ways of bringing the same product to market. It is an innovator that produces the status quo, preserving that which already exists. This is not another dot-com bubble or risky financial innovation, like the collateralized debt obligations in the financial crisis of 2007 and 8. Instead, my interlocutors champion a kind of what I'm going to call nostalgic innovation, end quote. While facing the prospect of becoming a sunset industry, they're putting themselves forward as proven and established entrepreneurs who don't bring new products to market, but instead excel at continuing to generate value from the familiar, from the conventional. In their mocking dismissals of renewables, mobilizing facts to make broad conclusions that renewables have no place other than making the left feel good, my interlocutors bring a particular future into being for themselves. A future that if changed very little from today is in their own interest. A future that isn't threatened by questions, by challenges and by counter arguments about competing energy regimes. A future in which oil and gas is certain to remain crucial. By focusing on and mobilizing facts such as energy density, coal consumption and renewables land use, interlocutors are drawing on and captured by the truth-making potential of facts. They are creatively constructing what is for them their own feel-good future. Thank you.